morning again. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 9. Book of Mark, chapter 9. While you're turning there, I want to thank Pastor Joe for filling in last week while I was away at the convention. I uh, appreciate his uh, faithful teaching, leadership, just an encouraging word uh, on the cost of discipleship and giving us a vision of what it looks like to walk with Jesus in some very real and practical ways. So I'm thankful uh, to Joe for filling in in that way and leading so well. I also want to say really quickly, um, I want to say thank you uh, to our church, to, to you all. Uh, today marks uh, one year since my first sermon here as your lead pastor, and uh, I think the Lord had me, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm thankful to you uh, for, the, for the way you welcomed our family, encouraged us. Um, you guys are a sweet people, and I'm really grateful to God to be your pastor. I'm thankful to be here, so thank you for that. I think the Lord put that anniversary on Father's Day, so I wouldn't forget it, because I'm terrible at remembering stuff like that, and so um, that, that's great. Hey, we're in, a, we're in Mark chapter 9. We're going to work through a big chunk of this uh, text today, and, and what, Mark, what this chapter has, what this passage has in it for us is a little bit of a preview. It's kind of like a coming attractions, right? You know, you go to the movie theater, people still do that, some of you, not many people though, but when you go to the movies and that you do the previews and it feels like there's like a hundred previews now before the movie. Like if the movie starts at 10, you're not watching the movie until 1045 because you're going to do so many previews, right? Uh, usually I kind of ignore the previews. I, I gloss over them, forget about them, don't care about them. Uh, but a, a few years ago I was in a movie and I saw a preview for Top Gun 2, and let me tell you, it got me. I got fired up. I got fired up for Top Gun 2. Yeah, we, you, we, can applaud, uh, we can applaud Top Gun, absolutely. A triumph of cinema, if you think about it. So anyways, I, I got fired up for, for Top Gun 2. Top Gun 1, one of my, one of my favorites, uh, totally unrealistic. Uh, to any of you Navy, naval aviators out there, you know not much of it is accurate. But it's awesome to watch on screen, and I was excited to see what... Uh, the updated version would look like. And so in the, it took like two years be, for that movie to come out because of COVID and delays and stuff like that. And I must have watched the trailer for that movie a hundred times, like just waiting for it to come out. Just eager to, to get, you know, they would release a new trailer so you get another little quick view, a quick preview, because you just wanted to have a sense of what was it going to be like. You know, you can't wait to get there. What's it going to be like? And you, you watch the trailer over and over and over again to get a taste of what's coming. Uh, I, in a little bit of an embarrassing aside, I asked my wife this morning if I should tell you this. Uh, I actually, I probably shouldn't. It's too late now. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have a friend um, who actually rented out a theater for the, for the premiere of, of Top Gun 2, and we went uh, to the movie. Uh, I actually put on like a bomber jacket, like it, 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 I got in costume. You know, I used to make fun of the people that they go to Harry Potter in costume, or they'll go to Star Wars in costume. I was like, you guys are ridiculous. But the chance to put on a leather aviator jacket and some sunglasses, I'm like, I might just do that. I think I'm going to dress up for this. And so we went and enjoyed the... It was fun. They had, a, they had an electric guitar player that played the opening scene there. Like, it was, it was cool. Anyways, I'm a Top Gun fan. They're coming out with a three. Did you know that? They may ruin it with three, so I'm a little skeptical. We'll see. Today's text is a preview. Uh, it's a preview of what's to come. And so uh, and it gives, hopes us, hopefully it gives us a vision of where we're headed and how we get there is my, my goal uh, this morning. So I'm going to read Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 29, so settle in, uh, and then we'll see what the Lord has to say to us through it. Mark chapter 9, beginning verse 2 says this, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. This is, I like this little verse here for Peter. It says, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified, which is classic Peter. I don't know what to say, but I'm going to say something, right? Verse 7, it says, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept this matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead might mean. Verse 11, they asked him, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written that the Son of Man... That he, of the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you, Elijah has come, 
And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Verse 14, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd gathered around them, and the scribes were arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And so I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, he immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, then have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this last verse. That There's some things in life, some spiritual strongholds that are too difficult for us to break through on our own, and we need to come to you. And so, Lord, Lord, this morning, as your people, we do come to you in prayer and ask that you open your word to us, that you reveal yourself to us, that we would see you clearly in these passages. Would you speak to us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you draw us to you? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Really simply, the main idea of these three little stories this morning, I'm convinced, is this, is that those with even the smallest faith get to see Jesus. Those with even the smallest faith get to see Jesus. We start this passage with, with a scene that shows Jesus in his glory. And that's, that's our first point, Jesus in his glory. Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, who are kind of his inner circle, his core crew. He takes them up a, a high mountain. It doesn't tell us which mountain, probably near Caesarea Philippi, where uh, Peter made his confession last week in chapter 8. He takes them up to a high mountain. And as they're up there, Mark says, kind of gets to the point, he says, he was transfigured before them, which is okay. It's like, wow, great. Uh, and, and what this word means, it means he was, he was changed. His, 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 his substance changes. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't actually change, but his appearance to Peter, James, and John was changed. And, and really what's happening here is, is in a sense, uh, the veil of Jesus' humanity is being lifted. And they get to see Jesus in his glory instead. Instead of kind of the, 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 his body, his flesh kind of hiding Jesus' uh, nature as fully God, it, it's, it's lifted a little bit so they can see a little preview, a little picture of what Jesus will be like in his glory. As if that wasn't enough, two other guys showed up. They just appeared out of thin air. Elijah and Moses, two major characters from the Old Testament, they show up. And it, it's, it's, it's such a fascinating passage to me. It, it says they're sitting there and they just start chit-chatting with Jesus just shooting the breeze, you know. I, I would give any, Matthew tells us what they're talking about. You can go read his account. But it'd be so cool to hear a detailed accounting of that conversation, you know, just to just check it in. I, it's just fascinating to imagine what might have been said between Moses, the great leader of Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and through the desert to the promised land. And then Elijah, this great prophet of God who lived with such power that most have never seen. These two men stand there with Jesus talking with him. And as that's happening, as that's happening, Peter says something dumb, which is typical for him. And he says, let's build some, some tabernacles, some tents here. And he's, he's doing his best. He's trying to honor. He recognizes the significance of the moment. And he's trying to honor that. And then this cloud envelops them on the top of the mountain. And out of this cloud comes the voice of God that says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And just as quickly as this episode has started, it ends. The cloud dissipates. Moses and Elijah are gone, and all that's left there is Jesus with his disciples. What what is this? What's going on here? Why is this here? I think there's a few reasons this is here. Number one, this is here 
as a direct result, an answer to the, some of the questions Jesus has been getting and some of the questions Jesus has been giving over the last chapter or two. You recall a couple of weeks ago we talked about this idea that the Pharisees keep demanding. They said, show us a sign from heaven. Jesus says, no sign is going to be given to you. But he does give a sign to Peter, James, and John. That's the ultimate sign from heaven is this, right? This is it. This is what they're after. This is what they're looking for. And Peter, James, and John get that sign from heaven. Why? Well, it's because of the way and the timing with which Peter answered Jesus' question last week. When they asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter finally answers the question correctly, that Jesus is the Son of God. And as a result of that, as a result of the faith demonstrated by Peter and answering that way without the sign, he gets the sign. He gets the confirmation of his faith. In the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah are significant figures, but they're kind of, they stay in their own lanes in the, in the history of, of the people of Israel. They don't, they don't really intersect. You don't see them talked about together uh, at all, except for one time in the Old Testament, the two men are mentioned together at the same time. And it's in the book of Malachi, the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 4. Beginning of verse 4, it reads this way. It says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. There's this understanding for the people of Israel that both the Moses, the prophet like Moses is going to come. And like we talked about several weeks ago, and there's also this understanding that Elijah is a forerunner, a precursor to the Messiah coming. And so... As a result, God sends Moses and Elijah as confirmation that that time is here. The Messiah has come. The Savior has come. We, we can't understand the Mount of Transfiguration without understanding Moses and Mount Sinai, though. It's really important that you see some of the parallels here. So just hang with me for a second as we compare and contrast what happens at Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. If you want to flip to Exodus 24, you can. I didn't put it on the screen, but you may want to follow along. In Exodus 24, Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai. He's, he's there at Sinai in Exodus 24. He's here in the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark 9. Both of these things, they take place on a high mountain, it says. In both stories, a, a cloud covers the top of the mountain. In both stories, a six-day interval leads up to these climatic events. And on the seventh day in each of these stories, God speaks from the mountain on that seventh day. Mount Sinai, as you know, is where God gives the law to his people. And at Mount Sinai, Moses' face, the text says, it shines, it radiates when he comes down from the mountain. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is clothes. They shine, they radiate when he's on the mountain. At Mount Sinai, the fear that people have in seeing Moses, it, it's very similar to the fear that Peter, James, and John have when they see Jesus. There's great fear when you see some of this glory exposed. What we're supposed to see here, what we're supposed to understand about the Mount of Transfiguration is that Jesus is the new and better Moses that we are to listen to. Just as the people of God were to listen to Moses and the law that he handed down, so now we are to listen to Jesus as he is now God's spokesperson. Jesus stands in a line of heroes that hit Israel, of Israel that God has used in amazing ways to deliver his people. Moses, certainly. Elijah, definitely. And now, Jesus. We're meant to learn that all the required steps for the Son of God to show up have taken place. And I think most importantly, what you notice is that Moses and Elijah don't stick around, do they? They're gone. And all that's left for Peter, James, and John to adore, to follow, to worship, to listen to, and to learn from is Jesus. No longer is the law the path to God. No longer are there more prophecies to be made about the future coming Savior. He's here. The fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of every prophecy is standing there in the person of Jesus. This transfiguration, it's a preview. It's a coming attraction. It's a preview of what Jesus will be like in glory, in the new heavens, in the new earth. When we get to heaven, we're going to see God in his glory. We're going to have face-to-face -face fellowship with Jesus. Do you know that? We're going to be able to talk to Jesus face-to-face -face like you would talk to a friend. 
This is what the people, this is what Adam and Eve had in the garden, face-to-face fellowship with God, a conversational relationship with him in perfect peace and harmony. Sin, of course, ruins that. And the new heaven and the new earth, Revelation 22, gives us a little picture of what we're going to have. It says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night and day will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever. And ever. This is what awaits you and I if we are in Christ. Face to face fellowship with God. Him radiating light so much so that we don't need a sun and a moon anymore. A place of total joy, constant satisfaction without pain or disease or death. A place where sin doesn't exist and the consequences of sin doesn't exist. It's a place that's tough to imagine, but a place I want to be desperately, don't you? In the New Testament, there's a book called the Book of Hebrews, and the Book of Hebrews is all about how Jesus is better than anything the Old Testament has to offer. That's the whole, that's the thesis of the book. Jesus is better than anything the Old Testament has to offer. In Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12, there's a couple of verses that tell us how we get to this. This is the goal, right? Seeing Jesus in his glory, being with him in his kingdom and in heaven. How do we get there? Hebrews 11:6 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Step one in getting to heaven is faith in God. Step two, Hebrews chapter 12 says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, sounds a lot like transfiguration, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Once we put our faith in Jesus, the next step is to keep our faith there. The Bible says those who endure, those who stay on the path, those who continue to follow Jesus until he comes back or he takes us home, those people get heaven. We get Jesus. We get the kingdom of God. That's the plan. Put your faith in Jesus, follow Jesus with your whole life, and you get heaven. I'm curious this morning, does anybody else find that hard to do? Like, it's hard following Jesus. Can we be honest for a minute and admit that? That what God calls us to is not easy. There's a reason the Bible calls it a narrow path. It's difficult to walk. It's difficult to stay the course. It's difficult to stay on track. It's difficult to live the life God's called us to live. It's hard. That's why God says, hey, you're going to need supernatural power to do this. You're not going to achieve it on your own. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And even then, it, Paul's going to like it to a struggle. It's a race. You're going to have to work at it a little bit. It's a difficult task. Here's what I want you to know this morning. If you're here and you think it's hard to keep your faith in Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus, to stay on the path, I want you to know that you're in good company. It was hard for Peter, James, and John, too. Constant screw-ups, constantly messed up. And yet, Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus in his glory. Guys who never could get it right, never could stay on the path, got to see Jesus. You, you see that here in this next little section. The, these guys lack understanding. They lack the understanding that Jesus is asking of them. They lack understanding of the scriptures. They lack understanding of the Bible and of the order of operations that the Messiah is meant to work through. And this is our second point. Lack of understanding you see in these men. Look at verse 9 of our passage again really quickly. It says, They were coming down the mountain. Jesus charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what is this rising from the dead might mean. They asked him, why does the scribe say that Elijah must come first? Jesus said, Elijah does come first to restore all things. But how is it written that the Son of Man should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. So they're, they're coming down from this mountain of transfiguration. They're coming down from this literal mountaintop experience with God. And not surprisingly, they have some questions. They're like, whoa, what was that? Jesus, we're going to need you to sort that out for us, right? This Elijah guy, can you tell me how that works? What does that mean? 
What do we make of this prophecy that Elijah is supposed to come before the Messiah? How do we navigate that? And Jesus tells them uh, Elijah actually has come. He's referring to John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1 tells us that Elijah, or John the Baptist came in the power and spirit of Elijah. Jesus says Elijah has come basically in the form of John the Baptist. And what did they do to him? They killed him. They did to him whatever they wanted. Chopped his head off, put him in jail, all those types of things. That's happened already. Jesus says, what's more? Imagine what they're about to do to me. Look what's coming down the pipe for me. It's not this majestic scene that you're imagining. So many of the Israelites at this time imagined the Messiah coming in on a white horse, taking everything over, wiping out all the bad guys, making the Jewish people uh, have this awesome, amazing kingdom, and everything would be great. Jesus says, Elijah has come, and the Jews killed him. The Son of Man has come, and the Jews are going to kill me. That's not what you think, Peter, James, and John. It's just another of a long line of instances when the disciples do not understand the messianic formula the Bible spells out for the kingdom of God to come. It's like algebra to them. They can see all the elements, X and Y, and they can see the numbers. They can't figure out how it equals the right number. The first eight chapters of Mark's gospel, you remember, are filled with stories like this where the disciples don't get it. They don't understand. They don't know what they should know. Later in this very same chapter, the disciples are going to be, these same disciples who are on the Mount of Transfiguration are going to be arguing about who's the greatest in heaven. They don't get it. These guys constantly mess up. They don't know their Bibles as well as they should. They regularly fail to grasp what Jesus is saying to them. And yet, they got to see Jesus in his glory. Peter, James, and John get a taste, a foretaste of heaven even though they don't have the knowledge required. And I've got to tell you, this is good news for you and I, isn't it? You ever feel like you don't know enough of your Bible? Anybody ever feel that way? Like you don't know enough verses, you don't understand the theology, you don't understand how it all connects. Maybe you've got somebody in your small group who does know all the answers, and you're like, man, I'm never going to get there, right? You ever feel like Jesus tells you the same thing over and over and you still don't get it? You ever feel like no matter how hard you try, you always do or say the wrong thing? Hello, Peter. I'll tell you if so, you're in the same club, but once again, it's Peter, James, and John. How can it be possible that people that don't know their Bible like they should, that they don't know the scriptures, they don't know the theology the way they probably ought to, how can it be possible that those people get to see Jesus? The answer is because getting into the kingdom of God is not about what you know. It's about who you know. Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus because he has a relationship with them, not because they can pass a Bible exam. There's no entrance exam at the gates of heaven. They're not going to ask you to list the 66 books of the Bible in order. They're not going to ask you to recite some Bible memory verses. They're not going to ask you a a systematic theology question. They're going to ask one question, one question only. Who is Jesus to you? And if your answer to that question is Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead, guess what? You're in. It's not what you know. It's who you know. When I was in ninth grade, I was a terrible student. I I took algebra in ninth grade. Mrs. Doker was my teacher. She's retired now. Doubt she's watching. Mrs. Doker was a difficult teacher, and I was a bad student. That's a tough combination, Okay. Second semester of freshman year algebra, the the way your final grade is calculated for the second semester, or at least was then, is they take your grade in the first nine weeks, they take your grade in the second nine weeks, and they take your grade on the final exam, average those three grades, and that's your grade for the semester. You need a C to pass. I had a a C the first nine weeks, I had a D the second nine weeks, and so that means I needed a C on that final exam to pass. Here's the problem. The bad habits that led to me getting a D in the second nine weeks led to me not being prepared for that final exam. I walked into there, and I don't know if you remember when you were in grade school and you take a test and you look at that test and you realize, I'm about to bomb this. You just look at the first few questions and go, I don't have what it takes. (laughs) This cold sweat comes over you, and that's exactly what happened to me. I took that test. I guessed. I tried to show my work. I tried to fool Ms. Doker into thinking I knew algebra. I didn't know a lick of algebra. Took that test turned it in, and went home and started formulating how I was going to make an excuse to my parents. I don't think I've ever told my mom and dad this story, so if you're watching, I apologize. We survived. (laughs) A few days later, go to class. Ms. Doker announces 
like the average score for the class was like a 65. Like everybody had bombed the test, not just me. And I was like, if that's the average, I'm like, oh boy. You start doing. But then she announced that she did something that she had never done in the entire year I've been with her, that she was curving the test. Yep. And the high F that I had earned magically became a low C. <laughs> to God be the glory. Great things he has done. I passed Algebra 1. Amen. I passed Algebra 1. That's how I felt too. I passed Algebra 1 despite not knowing enough to pass Algebra 1. And I resolved from that day forward to take the easiest math classes my school had to offer. (laughs) Church, I, I, I tell you, in the same way the disciples get to see a glorified Jesus despite not knowing all the right answers, not knowing the formulas... And you and I get to see a glorified Jesus despite having incomplete knowledge, despite not living up to the marks that we had set for ourselves, the Lord has even set for us. Does that mean we don't study the Bible? No, of course not. But we don't study to earn our way into God's kingdom. We study to know the man who's letting us in. We study not to learn facts, not to get to know scriptures and verses and theology. We We study to know Jesus. The way in. We want to know this man who would do this for us, who would die for us when we didn't deserve it. We want to know him, and so we study the way he's spoken to us, not to earn our way in, but because he's led us in by the blood of his cross. Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus in his glory, not because they had enough knowledge, but because they had a relationship with Jesus in church. That's our path, too. The next story we, we see, though, is, is a man who doesn't have enough faith either, right? So they've come down from the mountain, and Jesus stumbles across this Seen. There's kind of a, a, a discussion going on, a debate going on, an argument taking place. And so Jesus steps in and he goes, hey, what, what's going on here? What's, the, what's this argument between the scribes and my disciples about? There's nine of them left and they had apparently been trying to cast this demon out of this boy and they hadn't had any luck. And so they're in a, a, scri- a discussion with the scribes about it. The scribes are probably making fun of them. The disciples are feeling bad. They took our VIP disciples away. They just left us with a JV down here. And of course we couldn't get it. So Jesus comes up and he asks, what's going on? And this, this father screams out from the crowd, I'll tell you what's going on. Your disciples are terrible exorcists. Uh, and it's, he, just, he basically says, hey, my son's got a demon. I brought him to have that demon cast out and your disciples couldn't do it. And Jesus says, basically, hey, listen, okay, that's fine. Let me get some facts and we'll pick up the story in verse 21. Jesus asked this father, he says, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. And then the dad says this. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus, maybe a little bit indignant here, says, if you can, right? If, if you can. He says, let me tell you, all things are possible for the one who believes. In other words, he's saying, I can do it if you believe. If you have faith, I can do it. And immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. What a great prayer. What a great prayer. I believe, help my unbelief. This man has incomplete faith. He has a measure of faith in Jesus, but he also has his doubts. Uh, One one pastor has phrased this man's response this way. He's pointed out that Jesus could have said at this point, He could have said a lot of things. Jesus could have said, hey, sorry, this small measure of faith you've got, it's not good enough. Jesus could have said, I'm the glory of God in human form. In fact, these three guys just saw that. He could have said, purify your heart. Confess all your sins. Get rid of all your doubts and all your double-mindedness. And once you have done that, once you have surrendered to me totally and can come before me with a pure heart, then you can ask for the thing that you need. But that's not what Jesus said to him, is it? Jesus turned immediately to the boy and went to work casting that demon out of him. He takes this man's imperfect faith, and he heals the boy. This man gets to see the power of Jesus, despite having weak faith. And I got to tell you, I'm so glad that weak faith is enough for Jesus, aren't you? I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I'm not kidding when I tell you this is my favorite prayer in all of Scripture. It encapsulates what I think so many of us feel so often about our walk with the Lord. I believe in you, Jesus, but sometimes I doubt. I believe in you, Jesus, but sometimes I don't act like it. 
I believe in you, Jesus, but sometimes I forget what you've done for me. I believe in you, Jesus, but sometimes I question if it's all really true. Jesus, I believe in you, but if I'm honest, sometimes you frustrate me. Anybody ever said that? Jesus' reply to us in these moments is, it's good enough for me. When we doubt Jesus remains true. When we don't act like we should, Jesus is obedient for us. When we forget what he's done for us, he doesn't forget about us. When we question if it's all really true, Jesus remains the way, the truth, and the life. And when we are frustrated by Jesus, it's great news that Jesus isn't frustrated by us. It's that he's patient and kind and compassionate towards us. Church, our access to the kingdom of God is not determined by the strength of our faith. It's determined by the object of our faith. It's not how much faith we have that matters. It's who our faith is in that counts. This is why Jesus can say that the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. Why? Because it's not the size of the faith that does the moving. It's the Jesus. It's the God who created the mountains that does the moving. And if we've got a little faith in him, he can take that and do anything with it. So if you're here today and your faith, you're going, I don't know. There's not much to it. Jesus goes, I can work with that. I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. I know there's some people here who think that you're on the outside of the kingdom of God because your faith doesn't look as big as your neighbor's or as the guy in your Sunday school class or the person sitting next to you. You think you're outside God's kingdom looking in because your faith goes up and down and it wavers and it varies and it changes. You think that because you have a weak faith in Jesus, Jesus has no faith in you and so you can't come in. I want to tell you that Jesus says, hey, even the smallest measure of faith in me, that's enough. I can work with that. I want to put us at ease a little bit as a church of thinking we have to hit some magical bar, some level, as if it's like a scale of one to ten and we got to hit a seven or else God's like, nope, not enough. He says, faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. If there's a measure of faith in your heart, lean on that. And Jesus will welcome you into his family and into his kingdom. As we close, I would, I would ask you where you see yourself in this story. What do you lack this morning? As you sit here today, which part of this do you go, yeah, I don't have enough. Maybe it's knowledge. I don't know enough Bible. I don't know enough theology. I don't know enough verses. I'm not sure how this all works together. What do you lack this morning? Maybe you're here and you're going, the faith, that's what I lack. I'm struggling with that. I, I do have a measure of belief, but it's not as strong as I want. And some days it, it's not there at all. It goes up and down. It's all over the place. I don't have enough faith. Surely God's done with me. Where are you this morning? Here's what I want to tell you. There are some minimum requirements. There are some basics, and here they are. Here they are. Here's the basics that are required to be in the kingdom of God. You have to do two things. One, you have to know the basics of the gospel, and you have to believe that they're true. You have to know the basics of the gospel, and you have to believe that they're true. The basics of the gospel are this, that God created the world and everything in it. And he created us, and yet we have violated God's laws, God's commands, God's statutes, and we have wandered away and done what we shouldn't have done. We are sinners. To pay the price for our disobedience, God sent his son in the form of Jesus to earth to live a perfect life and die on a cross for you. And that death on the cross pays the price for your sins. Jesus was laid in a grave. He got up from that grave three days later and walked out of it alive. If you know that, You've got the basics of the gospel. Is there more to the story? Absolutely. And it's awesome. It's fun to get into and learn. But these are the basics. And the second thing is you've got to believe that's true. Once you know the essentials, all that's left is to believe it. And sometimes we think of belief like a feeling, like it's got to like bubble up inside of us. And it's like, oh, there it is. I believe, right? It's kind of like indigestion. You're like, where did that come from? It's not how faith works. Faith, by and large, is a decision. It's a choice that you get to make. You get to decide, I think this is true. Do I have all the answers? No. Do I understand how this resurrection thing works? No. Do I understand the second coming stuff, this glory stuff? No. Do I know all the stuff in the Old Testament about the law? Not yet. Getting there, right? But do I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sins and that he's fully God and that he rose from the dead and he did it for me? If you can decide, I believe that. Jesus says, that's enough for me. 
We'll sort the rest of the stuff later. You got the rest of your life to walk with me, and I'll teach you all this stuff. But believe that, and you are in. You are welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so my encouragement to you this morning, encouragement for me this morning, is with all the knowledge you possess and with all the faith that you can muster, put your trust in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus for salvation, that he can pay the price for your sins and bring you into his kingdom. Put your trust in Jesus for what you're facing right now. Think about this dad and dealing with this kid. You know how helpless he felt? Put your trust in Jesus to help you with whatever you feel helpless against. Put your trust in Jesus for your kids. If you're a dad in the room and you've got wayward kids, you put your trust in Jesus to bring them back. Or maybe you're a kid and your dad's wayward. You can put your trust in Jesus to get a hold of his heart. But with all the knowledge you possess, no matter how much that is or how little that is, and with all the faith that you can muster, even if it's just a little bit, Let's put our trust in Jesus, church. And if you do that, you'll be welcomed into his kingdom and we will get to see him in glory. That's the hope that we have in Christ. I'm gonna pray for us in just a moment. Man's gonna come back up and we're gonna worship God for his amazing grace towards us. If you've never made that decision, though, you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've, you've, you've thought you haven't hit some arbitrary level of knowledge that you were trying to hit, or you haven't hit some level of faith that you were trying to hit, and so you've never made the decision to trust Jesus, and you want to do that today, I would love to talk to you about it. I'll be back in the back of one of those tables back there. I'm not going to make a big show out of it, but I would love to meet you, hear that you've made that decision, and talk to you about what your next steps are. I would encourage you. Is the Lord calling you, with a little bit of knowledge you have, and a little bit of faith that you've got, to trust him for the first time today? If so, obey and do that. And you too will see Jesus in his glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. I thank you that you've come for some people who aren't good enough, aren't smart enough, don't have enough faith, aren't obedient enough, aren't knowledgeable enough. And I'm thankful that you are all those things for us. You are enough for us. I thank you for living a perfect life that we were supposed to live. I thank you for dying a death that we were supposed to die. And I thank you for the free gift of salvation that you offered each and every one of us. Would you help us to grab onto it and never let go? We love you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. We worship you now. In Christ's name, amen.